Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ryan Wasser. Today, we're going to be talking about John Searle's article, The Future of Philosophy. <clears throat> now, I'm going to be using um, Zoom today, which is slightly different than what I usually do. I usually use Echo 360. But seeing as uh, I wanted to try this with a PowerPoint, I figured this would be a new way to go about it. So if there's any hiccups with the slides or whatever, um, you know, that'll explain it. Now, I'm basically going to be going through the first part of this in a pretty linear fashion since the article itself is pretty simple. Uh, we're going to overview the general ideas of the text, uh, and then we're going to move into a more explicit discussion of what Searle's concerned with uh, about the problems that, not the problems, but the future, as the title would suggest, a philosophy as Searle saw it in 1999. Uh, and during these situations, I might pose certain questions they kind of present you with something for food for thought. Um, and then if something jumps out to you, uh, by all means, go ahead and comment it in, 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 the, in the bottom. Uh, let me know what you think, because I'm, I'm by no means an expert in things John Searle. He's about as far apart from me as it gets on the spectrum of philosophical ideas. Um, that being said, I like to keep that conversation minimal until the end of the discussion where I'm basically gonna be talking about um, you know, what I think Searle does right, what I think he does wrong or doesn't quite get right, and um, also my kind of thinking about the future of philosophy. Um, so a little bit of background on Searle. Uh, he's he's uh, formally, <laughs> he's probably still respected in certain circles, and I'm going to say formerly respected uh, Professor Emeritus from UC Berkeley who specialized in the philosophies of mind and language. I say that because uh, I believe it was in uh, 2019, it was decided that he had conducted himself in, conducted himself in, a, in a way that was becoming a professor. He sexually harassed somebody in, the, uh, in his staff at some point in 2017. Um, but that's beside the point at this current moment. Uh, anyway, his, his, he, he concerns himself with a range of issues, specifically illocutionary acts, uh, which you know, might be taken as performative language. Uh, intentionality and then later tying those into issues of consciousness. Now, what's interesting about Searle is kind of his temperament on things. He had a series, maybe not a series, but he had a couple of very public debates with Jacques Derrida, um, who basically thought that Searle's view on uh, intentionality was basically flawed in its totalization of the issue. And Searle basically thought that that was a misunderstanding on Derrida's part. I don't think that's beyond the pale as far as Derrida is concerned. Uh, similar concerns <laughs> were levied by Gadamer uh, at Derrida, you know, when Derrida criticized, and it very much was a criticism of Gadamer's um, philosophy, or excuse me, hermeneutics of understanding. So that might just be kind of par for the course for Derrida. Anyway, uh, Searle also, as opposed to what typically, you know, the people that typically, uh, compose the uh, academic environment. Searle's basically like a libertarian in a lot of sense. In fact, he was a staunch anti-McCarthy uh, activist, uh, and he was a proponent of free speech, is a proponent of free speech, and he, uh, he actually, as a, um, a landowner, uh, I believe he owned apartments, uh, stood up against the Berkeley, 1980s Berkeley rent control uh, uh, stabilization program or was it 90s 90s excuse me so yeah uh a lot of these things actually kind of shaped the way uh searle articulates himself throughout this article now his overall project is pretty simple he, you know like i say he's attempting to kind of hew down a perspective pathway forward for the future of philosophy in relationship in, in relation to the developments of uh the sciences in the modern technological technological eras he ultimately comes to a set of conclusions that range and vagary, arguably the most important being a movement away from the necessity of epistemology, specifically epistemic objectivity, um, although his identification of the decentralization of philosophy away from big name geniuses towards a more collective, uh, cooperative philosophical endeavor kind of is a, is a more important and underpinning thing he alludes to throughout his paper. Um, Another thing that Searle's going to talk about frequently, besides systemic objectivity necessarily being, not necessarily being bad, but being a problem in uh, this movement away from big name philosophers, is a push towards like a hybridization of philosophy 
and uh, the sciences in the social sciences. Um, now there's one major glaring defect with Searle, and I'm gonna talk about this more towards the end, but uh, you know, it's, it's, he basically doesn't pay the continental tradition uh, much attention, um, which we'll talk about, you know, here momentarily. So anyway, his article's structured thusly. He starts off with a uh, description of uh, the history of philosophy starting in the 20th century, um, particularly starting with Frege, because Frege is, as we'll talk about, the, the, the theorist who basically gave rise to the philosophy of language as we know it in contemporary philosophy. Um, and then he provides a series of snapshots of the philosophical problems that he feels to be most, most alive um, at the time of the writing of this article. So as far as the history of contemporary philosophy is concerned, like I said, he started himself off uh, with Frege and he makes it clear that he has to start here if he's gonna understand 21st century philosophy. And I think he's absolutely right. Um, for an article, this makes sense. I wouldn't expect him to do a complete you know, history of philosophy because if he really wanted to push for a history of philosophy, he could have pushed back way beyond Frege if he's concerned with issues of language and discourse. But um, yeah, he, he, he starts with Freg because Freg was the first to kind of put into uh, to fully articulate work on quantifiable logic, which you know Searle sort of ultimately thinks was kind of based on a misunderstanding. But that's beside the point. Freg was important because he uh, gave rise to people like Birch and Russell, who thought that you know you could use logic to kind of structure and tidy up language across the board. Now, the important point here is that according to Searle, Frege's thinking allows for the possibility of contemporary logical analysis, uh, the primacy of philosophy of language, and furthermore, a centralized language as a means, uh, as a main concern in philosophy across the board. So Frege gave, acted as the ground for all of these things, specifically the fact that language would become a central key point in every discipline of philosophy, which is actually kind of true. Um, as noted, Searle moves right from Frege and Russell, and he briefly mentions the continental tradition, specifically the phenomenological tradition, tradition but he pays such short shrift that it's hardly even worth mentioning. You know, how can you bring up phenomenology without actually spending a little bit of time looking at, you know, um, how, yeah, how it led into hermeneutics in the 60s and 70s. How do you, I, I, I don't understand that, especially because a lot of the questions he's concerning himself with, kind of the movement away from the objective kind of empiricist view in epistemology, how can you argue for that and then not pay attention to what's going on in continental philosophy, specifically guys, with, specifically guys like Gadamer, Heidegger, and Ricoeur? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not actually going to spend any more time talking about his rudimentary history of the 20th century philosophy, uh, except to point out that he makes a very uh, strong categorical claim that the, that the philosopher's task is to state necessary analytic truths. I don't know if I agree with that statement. I don't know if I agree with the analytic part. Um, but maybe to a certain degree I am. I'm basically in agreement that philosophy is largely a conceptual uh, field that specializes in a conceptual analysis of things. Anyway, that's when he, then now he moves into his living problems, we'll call them. Um, and these are, again, based in 1999, which is really interesting because we're going to see certain things here. The first issue that he talks about is the mind body problem, which is basically the relationship between the mind and how it relates to the corporeal brain. Uh, and this underpins a lot of the under pro, uh, other problems that Cyril's going to talk about. I did it anyway, by the way. Let me, let me, let me move this forward. There we go. Here's John Searle. Uh, you might need to screenshot this because I'm going to go forward. Okay. Mind-body problem. Okay. So this is effectively the issue of dualism, dualism and objectivity in a Cartesian sense. And Searle's going to make the claim that we need to move away from this kind of rigid uh, position, and I agree. And again, this is something that's present in the continental tradition. He also talks about the problem of consciousness, particularly the issue of verifying consciousness. Uh, and Searle states about two pages in that we, we got to stop worrying about how the brain could cause consciousness and begin, the plain, uh, begin with the plain fact that it does. Again, I agree. 
Um, but this isn't anything people haven't already looked at before. But uh, so this is kind of one of those questions that I have popped up. You know, if the movement toward an integrated or more closely aligned philosophy science paradigm is warranted, that still doesn't get us any closer to the, the how or what of consciousness, at least not properly, only possibly the why. For example, we can and have figured out why the body is capable of future projection that deals with the functioning of the prefrontal cortex. But there's no reason to believe that science is going to be sufficient to explain how it is that it does that. Um, so the Heidegger would call this bodying forth. I don't know that we can uh, make a scientific claim about those things. This is really the area of philosophy. Anyway, Searle moves on to the philosophy of mind and its relationship to cognitive psychology. And if all the problems, I think this is the one that's on most solid ground. Um, Searle makes the claim that philosophy is closely interwoven, specifically philosophy of the mind is closely interwoven with modern cognitive psychology. And that if we actually really embrace that relationship, it's gonna open up a broader range of questions we can ask and hopefully answer. Um, we, we, we know this kind of to be the case. Um, look, look at personality psychology, uh, there are psychological methods, okay? Uh, you know, there's definitely relationships there. Um, Cheryl doesn't go much more in depth into it. He just basically alludes to the point that one of the things that we might be talking about, and I think we're starting to see this happen, more and more, especially with the advent of trans issues, is uh, the difference in psychology between uh, adults and children. Anyway, Searle then moves on to his next point, which is the prominence of the philosophy of language. Now, he correctly points out that the philosophy of language, or at least a formal philosophy of language in the 20th century was the prominent philosophy, and I agree. It kind of appeared in every uh, discipline to some degree or another. Now, for Searle, this isn't the case anymore. And the question he's asking is, why did it change? You know, he starts looking at how the philosophy of language effectively evolved into a uh, <laughs> philosophy, into, into linguistics, specifically pragmatic linguistics, which is effectively looking at how, um, it's, it's, it's a field of semiotics that looks at how context contributes to the meaning of speech. Uh, and again, this is something that up until recently has suffered from empiricism and in, in, a, in a real leaning on to objectivity. Um, so this is ultimately going to be something that Searle uh, asserts is based on a mistake, especially on the part of Frege. Um, Frege, according to Searle, had this kind of external causal view of meaning, basically the thing outside of me caused the meaning to which I attribute to a word. And, you know, that's that's a, a bit of an issue. I'm not necessarily sure I disagree with Searle. Uh, Searle effectively became concerned with causality in this sense. It, I'm not sure that he, there, there's really been a good argument for a thematized causality in relation to the meaning of words yet, at least not from the analytic tradition. I might point to um, certain thinkers in the continental tradition, but we're not gonna do that right here. Um, next, he moves on to what he calls the philosophy of society or philosophies of societies. And um, <laughs> I think this is actually one that's come most to fruition. Um, he, he posits a need for a new social philosophy that will stand shoulder to shoulder with the social sciences uh, as epistemology did with other, you know, more natural, more natural sciences. Yeah. But it's not self-evident that this is the most productive thing, uh, that science, the philosophy could be doing. Like it almost kind of makes the argument that philosophy is this almost vestigial remnant from a bygone era that we're just going to tack on to the sciences is kind of a, um, you know, it just, it just like an afterthought. Anyway, uh, what's interesting here is that he, almost, he, he doesn't really address the issue that social philosophies had already been a thing. <laughs> um, critical race theory specifically originated in the 1980s, but it actually rose out of the critical 
theory schools and, you know, the Frankfurt School. So it's already there. So I don't know necessarily how he's predicting this as much as he is uh, just kind of looking, seeing the trend trend up maybe. Um, he then moves on to a discussion uh, about, about a need for a more rigorous social ontology. Um, he basically made the claim that uh, political philosophy of the 20th century was effectively journalism. So once something was written, it was already dead. You know, it was already changing. And I think there's merit to that. I'd be interested to see how he feels about the same issue today in the age of technology. Um, lastly, he, he talks about the failures of social systems, uh, notably communism and the various forms of uh, socialism. And he claims that these failures and what he refers to as major events, and rightfully so, have largely gone, uh, gone unanalyzed. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but again, I don't know that that's true. Um, even in 1999, we had authors that were looking at those things. But anyway, the last point he makes here is he basically makes a suggestion for a, not a suggestion, he calls for a very strong mid-range analysis of uh, social institutions through various philosophical lenses. Anyway, next he moves on to issues of ethics. And again, Ethics are hallmarked by objectivity. Um, he doesn't make this a primary concern, he just kind of points it out. And to that, I always kind of ask, which ethics where? Um, if we're talking about ethics in the academic setting, sure, it's one of those things where we kind of sift out hard answers to these questions. But I don't think ethics in a very practical societal sense tends to be that cut and dry. So. He could have been a little clearer on what he, where he saw this objectivity, um, but that's about that. He doesn't really go much farther in detail than that. Um, one of the things he issues up though is that, you know, seeing as the pressure for objectivity was being lifted at that point, that we were seeing a resurgence uh, in certain kinds of ways of thinking. So he brings up Kant and Kant's categorical imperative which he ultimately concludes is going to be a failure of a project anyway, but he thinks it's interesting to see where it's going to go without the shackles of objective thinking. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think there's a lot to that. Um, I don't think that Kant is a failure. I think there's a lot to be said for deontological thinking, um, but that's neither here nor there for the time being. But, you know, is Kant a failure? is the categorical imperative of a failure in the year 2020. I don't think that happens to be the case, um, at least not totally. Uh, then he moves on to the philosophy of science. Again, objectivity is a concern. He doesn't spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, but he, he wants to go out of his way to make the claim that a lot of the philosophies of um, you know, science are highly unscientific. That's an interesting claim to me, and he brings up people like Karl Popper. Um, it, it, it almost seems to me like Searle's lost <laughs> track of the ground of what philosophy is here, which is funny because earlier in the article, he makes the point that, you know, philosophy deals a lot with conceptual issues. Well, if you're dealing with conceptual issues and you're not necessarily or explicitly dealing with facts, it, <sighs> That's really beside the point right now. Uh, he moves into a discussion of Kuhn, and uh, Kuhn, for anybody who's unaware, is a, a very important figure in cognitive psychology, specifically in relation to other thinkers like Piaget. Um, <laughs> but Searle actually spends a little bit of time ruminating about the fact that he doesn't understand why Kuhn was so popular, especially in philosophical uh, departments. Well, that's weird, as if you can only do philosophy if you're in a philosophy department. I, it's, kind of dismissive on his part. But anyway, his issue with Kuhn is that Kuhn effectively demystifies scientific analysis and the scientific method. And, you know, I got to kind of ask myself, okay, maybe he does do that, but is he necessarily wrong? You know, if everything rests on presuppositions, which science does, and if everything has an implicit ontology, implicit being the operative word, which science does, you know, yeah, him calling uh, science, modern day witchcraft might seem a bit hyperbolic, but it's not, you know, it, it doesn't seem wrong, especially if we consider like Newton, what is it? Newton's, Newton's first law, you know, that uh, any body left to itself, unless, you, you know, will 
I, I've definitely got this wrong. Basically saying that any body not impinged upon by some other body will continue moving forward in a straight line. Well, that whole law is based on a presupposition that we don't have any evidence of, you know? So <laughs> anyway, you know, there, there's a lot to be said for saying that science perhaps is unscientific in a lot of ways. Anyway, um, this could just scroll out of control into infinite regression. I'm not trying to go there. I'm just trying to make the point that, um, you know, Searle's concerned here with the way the philosophy of science is operating. And, you know, he, he ultimately uses this as grounds for a call for a return to the analysis of causation. And that's interesting um, because you see similar arguments between him and a lot of other thinkers. In my experience, you know, the latter, the, the, the late Heidegger was, you know, looking at similar kind of issues from a different perspective, of course. But um, so that those are those are the main points that Searle kind of touches on. And as I said before, he closes with a uh, again. I, I did it with this little slides. Philosophy of science. There we go. Searle closes by basically saying that reiterating the fact that. The sciences and philosophy need to come into closer proximity um, moving forward. Um, I don't know that I agree with that. And again, whatever I'm going to say right here when I'm talking about what Searle got right, I'm not an expert in Searle, um, and I'm not an expert in analytic philosophy. So by all means, I could be wrong about this issue. Um, so by all, if anybody has has that to say, but to that end, there was a lot of things um, that Searle said that show me that he wasn't looking at things from the other perspective either, and that's not necessarily a knock. Um, he just, he made some very categorical claim, strong categorical claims about where things would go without understanding that maybe we've already been there. Um, like I said, he doesn't, he doesn't touch on the continental tradition, but once he doesn't address things like burgeoning social philosophies from the 1980s. Um, you know, he, there was a lot he, he could have brought up there. Um, anyway, things he got right. His general notion that philosophy and sciences would come together in ensuing decades, that's, that's important. You know, a good example of this, uh, I think, where, you know, philosophy and the sciences are coming together would be moral foundations theory by J.C. Graham. Jonathan Haidt and a couple of, uh, Greg Lukianoff, I think is part of that uh, study. You know, it's, it's, it's just interesting because you've got a series of moral theories, moral philosophies, and you overlay them with a personological method of testing these six different domains of temperament. Um, and you get this highly repeatable and cogent overarching theory that not only is cogent on its own, but it also, relates well with other theories like the neo-personality inventories and big five stuff. So that's interesting. Um, again, I don't think he predicted the rise of social philosophies as much as he did simply forecast them becoming more prominent than they otherwise were. I know Gloria Anzal Dua, God, when did she die? Um, she was writing right around, well, prior to 1999, but she was writing in the eighties. That's, Social philosophy. So he's again doing one. Of, he's, he's he's kind of missing the boat there, but he's not wrong to point out that there was going to be an uptick in these things. And anybody who's spent any amount of time in academia over the last twenty years can tell you that gender stu gender studies, critical theory, um, queer theory, critical race theory, all of these things have blown up uh, and are and are massive. Uh, all things considered. So what do I think he missed the mark on? Again, <laughs> um, I think I think I think he was really uh, doing a disservice to philosophy in the 20th century in general by completely ignoring the continental tradition. And he didn't need to spend a whole lot of time on that. But if one of your concerns is uh, how objectivity is basically kind of polluting uh, philosophical theory and making certain lines of thought untenable, then why wouldn't you address the continental field? Think Levinas, where you know subjectivity um, and intersubjectivity is kind of key. Uh, 
I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think he could have been uh, a little clearer as far as his issues with ethics. Um, as noted, he was tying Kant's categorical imperative to the decline of objectivity, and rightfully so, but he doesn't actually spend any time explaining why he felt that certain forms of ethics would be ultimately be a failure. I think that was a, a miss on his part. Um, let's see. Uh, in, in fact, you know, he actually kind of comes across as a bit dismissive. Um, <laughs> you know, how do, how do you dismiss Kant? You know, I don't understand how you do that. Anyway, um, his assessment of the philosophy of science. You know, one problem I have with Searle's assessment of Popper in this section is his claims are that Popper's methods were ultimately uh, atheoretical and anti-scientific, and that's a major flaw. As I noted before, all science is inherently ascientific in the sense that it all rests on inferential, inferential suppositions. So it's not any, it's, it's not self-evident that atheoretical works and theoretical works are any, or, or any more uh, beneficial than the other. And in fact, as somebody who spends a lot of time with personality theory myself, I'll be the first one to tell you that Raymond Cattell's 16 PF personality uh, um, model, that was a theoretical. It's, 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 a, it's a linguistic model. It's used by compiling words and associating words to things, which is interesting, especially because Searle's interested in language. Well, why wouldn't he be concerned? Why, I don't know why that would never pop up. Maybe he just wasn't interested in that particular area. My point is that um, to be making claims that the philosophy of science is atheoretical and ascientific kind of seems moot to me. Um, so yeah, and his assessment of social philosophy, as I said, um, my big concern there is that Searle argues that the atrocities of the 20th century, specifically those related to communism and socialism, went unanalyzed. That's patently false. Um, you know, even, okay, well, I know Browning wrote Ordinary Men relatively uh, recently. I think it was 2004 or 2006. That's beside the point. You still had Solzhenitsyn, uh, Eli Weiss uh, wrote Night. You know, there were a lot of writers writing on the failures and atrocities of these social systems. Um, and there's also other writers, um, Milton Friedman, Thomas Sowell, writing on other systems. Uh, those are just two economists, uh, economic thinkers I can think of. But people are writing on these issues. I'm kind of curious as to why, <laughs> uh, how, you know, sort of miss these things. So where, where do I think philosophy is going to go? Well, I do agree that there's something we said about philosophy and the sciences being close together. Um, but I think a more important movement forward would be uh, really bringing the continental and analytical traditions together. You know, something I've been working on recently is using Hack's theory of found heritanism. For those who don't know, found heritanism is a kind of third way uh, method of lead justification in epistemology. Uh, I, th I think there's a lot to be said for that model as an ontological framework. I think other people could be doing similar things. And for those of you who like Charlie Brown, there's my alarm clock. <laughs> Sorry about this. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think we'd be more productive as our own discipline if we further integrated ourselves with each other first besides before moving outward. Again, I think Searle could have did a lot more with this article. Granted, he probably had a space limit uh, if he had been more conscious of the continental tradition. Um, I think uh, there's something to be said for the future of social philosophy, and I'm trying not to be biased here, although you know, it, nobody can ever be unbiased. And I'm not necessarily sure that everything the social philosophies have done have had a positive net effect regarding humanity. Um, and I think that technology kind of exacerbates this. For anybody who's interested in, I wrote about this in my recent paper called The Crisis, of, uh, Crisis in the Ethic of Finitude. Anyway, um, similar to Searle's 
it, concerned with unexamined atrocities from the 20th century. I think that there's quite a lot to be said about the efficacy of social philosophy and its attempt to liberate disempowered demographics. Um, you know, like, has critical theory, has critical race theory, queer theory and feminism, have they had a positive impact on larger society? Have they had a positive impact on the people that they purport to concern themselves with? Um, I'm not so sure that they did. As a gay person myself, I'll be the first one to tell you that I kind of feel um, simultaneously pandered to and disempowered by queer theory. Um, but that's just me. I'm just curious to see whether more studies aimed at con concepts like the pendulum effect or the Pygmalion effect, um, self-fulfilling uh, prophecies, become more prevalent as the years go on. And um, I, I, I put here the end of philosophy as we know it. What do I mean by that? Well, I don't mean end in the sense that philosophy is done. There's no such thing. As Heidegger points out, we're the metaphysical animal. Philosophy is never going to be done. That being said, when I say an end, you know, there are two ends on any given thing. Something goes from end to end. Every end is, a, you know, it's, there's a song that says that. Every new begin, beginning, or every new beginning begins from some other beginning's end. Same thing here. Where do we go now? Um, I think philosophy has one of two directions to go. Um, one, I think there's something to be said for philosophy moving into a more pragmatic domain. And by that, I mean, we ought to be looking at making philosophy more accessible to a greater number of people. And I don't mean dumbing the philosophy down. Um, I mean, making it so it's palatable. I'm a Heideggerian, no, well, I'm not a Heideggerian, but I'm a Heidegger guy. I like reading Heidegger. That being said, reading Heidegger is an acquired taste. <laughs> Most people don't want to do it, but there's a lot of valuable insights into there. And if we can give people access into that um, without perverting the underlying thoughts, and that's always a danger we run in interpreting a work, then I think that could be a way forward. Oh. Another thing uh, I think we need to be looking at is kind of a moving backwards. Um, Eagleman in an article on ethics, the title of which I cannot remember, but I will put it in the description below if anybody's curious, makes the claim that we need to be going back into nature and whatnot. And this is similar to concerns of Heidegger, Gadamer, Eastern philosophers, different Eastern philosophers. You know, um, that spoke Zarathustra says similar things. And, and I agree with this. I think um, we need to start revisiting the ground upon which the philosophy that we know today is based and we need to reassess where we're at. Um, Aristotle made the claim that all great thinkers think the same thing. Well, in an era when, you know, this is almost a productive environment where people won't need to publish or die and you need to come up with new theories or new interpretations of things. We spend less time looking at the ground of things and more time trying to stack more blocks on top of it, if will. Um, and I think that's actually uh, to our great detriment. Okay, that is John Searles on the future of philosophy. I'd be curious to see what you all think about this. Uh, by all means, comment in the area below, and I'll see you all soon.